Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us here in Washington, D.C., and those of you on the web, welcome. My name is David Stapleton, and I'm the director of the Center for Studying Disability Policy here at Mathematica. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our Disability Policy Forum about the progress that the Pathways to Career initiative has made toward helping people with disabilities find meaningful jobs. The, uh, the Center for Studying Disability Policy was established in 2007 to help the build the evidence base for sound, effective disability policy. Findings from our research can help inform disability policymakers, program administrators, disability organizations, and other stakeholders in support of their efforts to understand how public policies affect the lives of people with disabilities and can be improved. And one way that we try to inform our stakeholders is through these disability policy forums. This is the 35th one since we started, and uh, I'm probably the only one who's been to all of them, but uh, it's, it'll be a good one. So uh, many people, as probably most of you know, with intellectual and other significant childhood disabilities face a lifetime of dependence and isolation and poverty, and yet many also have substantial productive capacity. And in fact, we know from some work that Dina Livermore has done that uh, disability program beneficiaries with intellectual disabilities have higher employment rates than other disability program beneficiaries with disabilities. Uh, um, but um, it's about 19% for those with intellectual disabilities. But most uh, beneficiaries, about 70% of them, work in sheltered employment sort of situations, and they receive low wages, on average about $5.50 an hour. And you know, the problem that we're faced with is that uh, matching the capabilities of this, this individu these individuals to jobs where they can be more productive, uh, lead more rewarding lives, be more integrated in a competitive setting, is very, very difficult. For them, the path to productive careers that's taken by most young people is strewn with obstacles, ones that are often insurmountable without assistance or guidance from others. So Source America is actually trying to address this issue. And for those who are not familiar with Source America, it is one of two nonprofit organizations that administer the Ability One program. And Ability One uh, seeks to create employment opportunities on federal government contracts for people with disabilities through a network of nonprofit agencies uh, and partners. The, uh, the Source America effort that I've referred to is called Pathways to Careers. And our, our first two presenters will describe the initiative and how it works. Mathematica is evaluating what I would call a, this proof of concept pilot that's going on right now. And we are going to, we are assessing the extent to which the implementation follows the pathways models, adjustments that are being made along the way to improve the model or that maybe need to be made, uh, identifying the experiences of participants and what their outcomes actually are, the hope for outcome of long-term employment in a career uh, in an integrated setting. Um, so, so that's what this is all about. Um, and now I'm going to be tested because I just lost my bios for my speakers uh, here somewhere, I think. Yes, so our, our first two Presenters are from the Institute for Economic Employment, which is at Source America. Uh, I'm advancing slides, okay, I can do that. Uh, yeah. Here we go, all right. Yeah, so Brian Diatley is a senior manager. Uh, he focuses on workforce development and disability employment research. Uh, and then Therese uh, Finneman is going to be uh, speaking as well. She's a senior research manager and director of the Pathways initiative, I mispronounced your name, it's Fimian, sorry. Uh, she's worked there for nearly 20 years to promote economic self-sufficiency for individuals with disabilities. And, and they, the two of them will describe the Pathways to Career, career Initiative. And it's what very innovative approach to helping people with disabilities access community-based employment and share some experiences of the people who have participated in the program. And then my colleague, Gina Livermore, is going to discuss the findings from the initial part of the evaluation of the Utah Pathways Initiative. Dr. Livermore is the Deputy Director of uh, our Center for Studying Disability Policy, and she focuses her research on employment policy and health insurance for people with disabilities, and the two of us have been working together for longer than either of us would like to remember. Uh, after those presentations, we're honored to have Christopher Button from the Office of Disability Employment Policy 
uh, to talk about pathways to careers and how it fits into the current policy context and other federal efforts related to improving, improving outcomes, employment outcomes, particularly for people with disabilities. Uh, so she's officially the supervisory policy advisor for the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor, and she leads the Workforce Systems Policy Team, uh, which focuses on removing structural policy and other barriers to increasing employment and economic advancement for people with disabilities. So before we I turn it over, let me, there are a couple of housekeeping items to deal with. <coughs> First of all, <coughs> our session today does include both in-person and <coughs> online people. Excuse me. So please try to help ensure the highest possible sound quality for our webinar participants <coughs> by being quiet in the room and, and also silencing your electronic <laughs> devices. Uh, <laughs> Please, uh, please note also that we are video recording back there. We have uh, Rich on the video at today's session, and that's going to be posted on our website sometime next week, so you'll be able to come back and look at the back of your head. And the, uh, in the front of ours, at the conclusion of the presentations, we're going to welcome questions from our in-house and webinar audiences. So for those of you who are participating by the webinar, what we want you to do is to submit your questions electronically through the Q&A panel on your screen, and you can do it at any time. We'll, we'll collect them and at the end uh, alternate them with questions from within the room. But please, please ask them as you proceed, and don't be surprised when they don't get answered immediately. So that's it. Uh, now let, I'm pleased to turn the podium over to our first presenter, Brian Diatley. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so aligning community practices with trends in rehabilitation, researching and validating the Pathways to Careers initiative. The first slide we're looking at is a visual representation not only of, I think, my ongoing challenges with the PowerPoint suite, but also an attempt to show what Pathways is trying to accomplish. We have a universe of people concerned about employment with disabilities, and we have a new world that includes changes in legislation changes in funding, and I want to say changes in outlook, but I think it's important to know that that outlook has been an ongoing, in my view, 20 to 25 year process that values people with disabilities in the community. And Chris Button is going to talk, I think, a little bit more when she gets an opportunity about maybe a little bit around employment first and, and changes in WIOA and maybe even some CMS stuff. Um, what are our goals and objectives? What are we trying to accomplish? What have we been up to? Um, in a nutshell, we want to help people with disabilities, especially those with developmental disabilities or, 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 or persons with aut on the autistic spectrum disorder start and be successful in careers. We want to impact in a major way the underemployment and unemployment of those populations. We want to get away from what I've experienced in my career working as a board of employment, the churn, the turning, the low wage jobs, the entry level dead end jobs, and, and the impact that those services and those experience have on the people that, that, that were the participants that were, were attempting to, to assist. Um, we want to create an incentive for private and nonprofit or public employers to participate with the Pathways program. We want to attack that demand side in a way that we feel is, is somewhat unique. Uh, we want to build on past successes in our field. I take a moment right now to say that Pathways owes a huge debt both to the folks at Mark, Mark Gold and Associates, particularly um, Michael Callahan and Norseva Shumpert, and Martin Gary from Source America. I mean, what they did is make an effort to take best practices, take a look at those, and then I think we've added some unique features that make this model viable for the goals involved. So why the heck Pathways? A couple years ago, I'm having drinks with a director and his executive staff of a large employment service organization 
and I just briefly start talking about pathways to careers. And he says to me, no, Brian, no, I've done that, I've tried that, I'm not doing that anymore, my people aren't going through this anymore. And he went on to say that I can't keep staff in these jobs, I can't generate enough money to pay these people, the families of the people with disabilities that continue to fail in the community are pressuring me and my board, and I can't keep people at work. This is a no-go. We've done this. We've tried this. No. And I know that Teresa's sitting there looking at me going, hey, the message here is that Brian will drink with anyone. But the, <laughs> the, 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 the reality is, the message here is this guy didn't have a plan. He didn't have a strategy. And he didn't have a set of values that aligned well with what we're trying to accomplish. And I'm going to get to the values piece in a little bit. But that's why Pathways. Oh, well, sorry, guys. I skipped a slide. Four core strategies involved with what we're trying to accomplish here. The first is discovery, a concept that I, hopefully folks here are familiar with. If not, I'm going to talk a little bit about it in a second, but it's the core of what we're trying to do. It's a methodology that starts with the individual, and it's the first step, the first important step, and I think, in making what we be successful. The second strategy builds on discovery, paid internships, and expanded discovery. The third core component is the uh, way to try to get to the demand side of this equation, try to engage employers in a, different, in a different way, and use something that we call the employer tax adjustment to both incentivize employee, employers and to try to get to some of the problems around issues surrounding long-term supports for people with disabilities working. The fourth strategy is post-employment career supports, pathways being somewhat of a new program. We're not going to hear a ton about that today because we just don't have a lot of people at that stage right now. So discovery. What is it? Why is it important? How does it fit into pathways? Um, the discovery process is an alternative to what is traditional assessments for people with disabilities. When I was working in VR, it was Valpar, it was different clerical examinations, it was different inventories, it was different paper and pen assessments provided to people with disabilities in an office setting that gave them the direction for the rest of their careers. Um, I mentioned Michael Callahan earlier. I think Mike likes to say something along the lines of that when people take, when people with disabilities take these kind of tests, they're told they have a disability. What discovery does is help us view people with disabilities in their communities, in their environments, through a different lens. And it tries to take the information that we collect during that process and match it and align it with their potential for employment. It's not a plan. It's a foundation of employment planning that seeks to individualize employment outcomes for people with disabilities. And it's the heart of what we're trying to accomplish in Pathways. Expanded discovery or the value of paid internships. We've taken discovery and sort of just moved it one step further. Um, my experience before this program in, 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 both, in both working with people with disabilities and in doing job placement was not very successful, but there was a rush to the process. There was a pressure to the process that we want to somewhat avoid. We want to individualize it in a way that focuses on the individual. I mentioned placement earlier. Martin, Source America, oh, he says to me, we don't place people. Systems should not place people. You place plants. I mean, what systems should do are, is support people, is develop a process that figures out what they need, where they fit, what their best environments are, and use that process to develop careers for people. I mean, when we place people, again, we get into this kind of churn element. We think that, hey, it's our responsibility. It's us. We're doing the work, and these people are just sort of being maneuvered by some 
some silent hand, if you will. That's what we're trying to get away from in our model. When you learn and see people through a different lens in discovery, that allows those people to make a decision around whether or not when they're going through and they're learning about themselves and our staffs are working with these people, learning where they match. Everybody in the program is offered an opportunity to go from discovery into jobs. It's a value that we have. Respect the individual. However, and I, Gene is going to throw some data at us at, in, a, in a moment, but I believe that well over 90% of the participants to date have chosen to participate in paid internships. Paid, crucial word here. We don't want to devalue work. We don't want to send employers the idea that people with disabilities somehow get to volunteer for the rest of their lives. That's not a message that Pathways wants to send to either families, individuals, or certainly a community of employers that we're asking to participate with us in this process. So here, I think we do some, I don't want to say unique, but I think we do some really good things in thinking about the demand side of this equation. In Pathways, we engage employers before we start working with participants. We want to create a community of employers with a focus on a wide variety of jobs, a wide variety, meaning we've got, I think, one person who's, who's, in the, who's a chef who's working right now on our program. Other than that, there is no one in Pathways, I don't think, that's aimed toward any sort of traditional retail or food service opportunity. And that's not because we think all those jobs are bad. It's just because in using discovery and in using paid internships, we want to make sure that we match appropriately where somebody's career interests and abilities lie. So, like I say, we've got one person sort of in the food service arena, but not rolling silverware or in a dish room somewhere. The employer payroll tax adjustment is a simulated, Source America is simulating a payment to employers that we hope, and Mathematica is helping us investigate, that simply put is a way to pass on the savings that individuals with disabilities present to federal government when they go to work. So reductions in SSI and SSDI and Medicaid and in Medicare are then passed to the employer as a way of providing long-term supports and, and in also in a way, I think, of, and I, it's not, I don't want to say, no, none of the employers that Gina has, is, has evaluated have said the only reason we're involved with Pathways is we get this money. But it does present them with the idea that we're very serious about what we're doing we're involved in looking seriously at sort of some of the issues around SSI, SSDI, and certainly as it involves problems long term around money and support for people with disabilities six months, one year, two years down the road. So we use our employer payroll tax adjustment. I mentioned earlier, we try to engage employers before services are started. So when people come into the program, there's an array of options for internships. Employer sign agreements with our with, with our pilot sites before we place or we help people, I said place, before, <laughs> we, before, before people start paid internships. And those agreements stipulate a lot of different things. They explain the EPTA, but they also make employers agree to the fact that if indeed somebody's on a paid internship at their site, that they have an obligation to consider that person for employment. We're not looking to em for employers so we can take and just cycle people through various sorts of assessment activities at their spot. And that's not where we want to engage employers. We want to engage employers on a serious look at helping people start careers. And we think some of the things we do are, 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 are slightly unique. Um, I talked about values earlier, just and I mentioned it. What do we got here? Two. Oh, okay, okay. Um, real quick big value of Pathways is everybody gets to participate. We don't screen people out. There is no sort of um, hierarchy where somebody has to do this to get this to get this to finally get an opportunity to get a job. The values of Pathways is that everybody that's interested in a career should participate in our program. We had 85 families in Detroit last week 
looking for an opportunity for 12 slots to participate in pathways. Those folks will be randomly selected through a process that's and served. Um, four sites up, got 100 folks working right now, 100 folks participating in the process right now across four different sites. Um, this is Matt, Matt's the first person to get great paid career activity through Pathways. He works in Utah. My colleague gets the best thing here. She gets to describe and show you some of the successes that we've experienced. Therese? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, Brian's absolutely right. I, I get the, the honor, I guess, to, um, to talk about and share some of the stories of the participants that um, we've been working with, in, uh, particularly in Utah. Uh, but before I, I get into our, their success stories, that's really what I, I'm going to talk about is some of these successes that we've had. I, I do want to take a moment to, um, like the Academy Awards, right, to thank them, uh, the, partic the participants and their families and, and um, you know, the employers that kind of worked with us early on and really took the chance to say and kind of dream with us a little bit over the past three or four years as we were building this out. And, um, you know, sometimes it took a while for us to figure some of the, p the different elements out and the pieces out and the, the parents and the participants hung in there with us, and so you've got to give them a lot of credit, and, and, um, and we do. We give them a lot of credit, and we know that the program is only um, as good as it is because of their input and their um, willingness to walk through this with us, as well as the project uh, team out there in Utah and the different sites. Um, we've got um, staff in Virginia and Detroit and Boston, as Brian said. So we just really appreciate all the great work across um, all the different sites. Um, anyway, so yeah, this is Matt, and one of the um, the – uh, comments that Brian made was around discovery and how we're using discovery to systematically achieve better planning and better employment outcomes for people with disabilities. So Brian talked about the fact that typically you take a pen and paper assessment and use what we know that the individual has a disability to pretty much eliminate a lot or all options for them for employment in the community with some exceptions. So rather than take that information that's not particularly helpful, what we are able to do to discovery is to find that the information that's really going to give us um, tailored, individualized um, uh, planning around what's going to be the most effective employment location, their interest area, and really for us looking at what they can contribute on day one to that employer. Because we want to make sure that the value is there's a mutual benefit for both the employer and the individual with a disability. That on day one, the employer is saying, oh, I, I really understand why the team thought that this would be a great employment location for this individual. So for us, um, as Brian mentioned, Matt is a great representation of um, good information and how that can impact um, employment outcomes for an individual with a disability. And Matt was the first individual to be hired through the Pathways process and really gave us a lot of insight and intel around, wow, this, could this really work? Can this really you know, kind of come together? So we met Matt um, as a result of him opting into Pathways from being on the Medicaid waiver waiting list in Utah. And unfortunately, like a lot of folks and a lot of the participants and a lot of people that you all know, by the time um, he uh, you know, opted into Pathways, he'd had a couple of work experiences that did not work out. And he was literally sitting at home watching TV, playing you know, video games, what we, you know, the, the story that we hear over and over and over again. And when we're talking to him and we're talking to his um, his family and the people that know him about what he could contribute and, and you know, um, who he is and what he does. I mean, we just got blank stares everywhere. And, and even Matt himself is that I just don't think I have a lot to offer to an employer. I want to work and I want to contribute, but I don't see that I really have a lot of skill and ability to, to, to bring to an employer. And the, obviously the really cool thing about Matt is, and we capture this through the discovery process, you can see these pictures. I mean, he is just, as are all of the Pathways participants, rich with skill and competency and capability. And it's just a matter of teasing out the right, that right information. So in Matt's case, um, he had a real interest in outdoor motorsports and outdoor motor vehicles, and he had some skill set around that. And he also knew how to use the computer, and he had a mind for math. And we were able to take all of that that we learned about Matt, and we found an, a, a small business in his, kind of in his community, Newgate Motorsports. I want to get a, a shout out to all the great employer partners that we have out there that are working with us. And, um, and we, ta we talked to them about Matt, and it turned out they had um, an opening for some inventory work that needed to get done in their motorsports shop. So we were able to connect his area of interest around 
outdoor motorsports and numbers and math and his skill set with a computer and bring this all together in, in an internship. About halfway through the internship, words coming back from the employer, one, that we're going to offer employment, and two, we don't want you offering it before we get to it. So that was another great lesson for us in terms of the feedback from employers saying, we really respect the process that you're using. We love that you're working to find that mutual benefit and putting the internship together with us and looking for the support needs and all that we're doing in, in that process. But don't take away our right to really be an employer and, and, and do what we typically do. And that was, I think, a, a great example of that with Matt. So Matt's been employed since um, January of um, 2013, so th for three years now. So, and as I said, he is the, the longest employed individual through the Pathways model. The second individual I'm going to introduce you to, this is Ethan. And Ethan um, opted into Pathways from the, tr the, the transition programs, from the um, Davis School District transition program up in Davis County, Utah, so just north of Salt Lake City. And um, again, just thinking about Ethan, he's young, he's interested, and he wants to work. but trying to pull all the pieces together for, you know, for, for him and for his family, they thought it was pretty daunting and that they probably couldn't do that on their own and find um, a really good job that might lead to a career for him. And through the discovery process with, with Ethan, um, we learned a lot about who he was in his interest area. And he was, he's an athlete of his own. He, he um, has a black belt, so he's very disciplined. And so we knew that that would be really important for us to kind of match that skill and that interest area that he had. And he also had just a profound, ob obvious love for the University of Utah. So he grew up in Salt Lake City. He went to the basketball and the football games with um, his family and, you know, and his, as he was growing up, and it was very much a part of his life. And so you know, we, um, we decided to really like, you know, kick it into high gear and see if we couldn't pull every string that we had to get with the athletic department at the University of Utah and meet with the athletic director there and present the concept of Pathways and the individual, Ethan, to the athletic director and say, this is why we think that this would be a really great opportunity for you, both in terms of meeting a workforce need, but also just you know, being part of this community of, of employers. And um, they, they bit. They said, OK, we're willing to go ahead and host an internship. And we customized a job for him in the, um, in the athletic department, had an internship. And you know, as I said, these are all success stories that I'm sharing with you. So um, he is now employed, and he has been for over two years, in the athletic department at the University of Utah. The other thing I want to point out about Ethan and what this white interest and following interest is so important, and he really taught us how important this was, is that it really helps to go beyond just integration and into inclusion. Because on day one, not only was Ethan adding value because of the skills that he brought, but he also had a common interest area with his coworkers and the peers in, the, in, you know, in, that, in that environment that he could talk about, the University of Utah, the athletics, that he had grown up loving and knowing and, and being, a, you know, being a part of being a, you know, a, um, a participant as the, you know, in, the, in the stands, if you will. So that's really important, and we want to um, hone in on that as much as we can because it really helps to bring that person to that full level of inclusion in their work environment. Um, this next individual, so I'm just going to say this. I'm going to... I'm talking fast, so forgive me, because they only gave me 15 minutes, and I could go on, obviously, for the day, talking about these folks. So I, uh, I apologize for the speed, my clip of speech, if you will, um, but I hope that uh, you know, I'm able to impart their, sto their stories respectfully and carefully, and just kind of, again, show you what we're learning about um, what we're doing and, and whether it's working or not. So Josh also opted into Pathways as a... Um, towards the end of his experience in the transition program in Davis School District. So he was 21, 22 years old when he opted into Pathways. And um, moving from the, the, the initial discovery and all that wonderful information that we can get about individuals and match that to potential opportunities in the community, and thinking of our expanded discovery approach. And as Brian mentioned, the, the main strategy that we use with the expanded discovery approach is the paid internship. And um, because the value of zero exclusion and zero fail and, and thinking about that mutual benefit and following the lead around informed choice is embedded into everything that we're doing. We can use these internships as a way to just learn more about what's working or what's not working for the individual or for the employer and get closer and closer and closer to what we really want, which is that goodness of fit for both the individual and the employer. And in Josh's case, um, 
we actually, we knew that he was a very industrious young man. He wanted to work hard. He wanted to kind of be in a manufacturing area, a lot of things going on, on his feet, lifting stuff, moving around. And so we were able to match him into three different internships in um, manufacturing environments. And he got a wonderful job offer from a, a business called, a company called Futura Industries. And he's been there for um, uh, over two and a half years now himself. But the thing that really stood out with the experience with Josh was the need to create flexibility in the process so that staff could, could work with the individual, the participant, and the employer to kind of get closer and closer and closer to that, that better match. So when we think about systems change and funding and services, we really need to bring that idea of flexibility into our conversation and, and re revisit that over and over and over because we don't want to be so rigid in, in the services that we provide that people can't actually get anything out of them. So three full internships that you know the project was paying seems like a lot of money but when we were able to kind of bring it all together and he got this great job offer you know it was definitely worthwhile and we learned so much about um, the need for flexibility and how it really ultimately ends up with a, you know a better outcome and this is Antonio Antonio I think might be our most recent hire through the pathways um, initiative and he's actually located in Detroit Michigan and Antonio also opted into Pathways from the transition program in Detroit. Um, Antonio had a very strong desire to work and to be out in the community and to be able to utilize all of his skills and abilities. And he'd actually had a couple of other work experiences that didn't pan out for him prior to, to working with us in Pathways. Um, and through a couple of them, um, he actually was himself able to kind of zone in on an, an area of interest that was really helpful for the team up in Detroit to kind of focus on. And that was, again, working with his hands. And, and he'd had another experience uh, working at a wood shop. And so he knew he really liked that, but he wasn't able to keep the job for a number of different reasons, part of which we were able to unearth in that discovery process. And that was around the work environment that would be the most ideal for him. So what kind of team dynamic needed to be in the work environment for him to be successful? And really making sure that there was somebody there that could act as a supervisor, coworker, mentor to him, and that for whom it was really just second sense to be able to, second nature, if you will, to be able to um, show Antonio how to do certain things. At, and as he was learning and growing and building his, his skill set, that it was very natural for this individual to bring him more into you know a, a more uh, depth of skill and ability within the field of. Uh, woodworking and in, in, in this particular wood shop. So after that internship, he was offered um, a job, and that's um, Action Wood 360 up in the D Detroit, Michigan area. And then we have this is Carolina, and Carolina opted into Pathways um, after being in the facility-based impro uh, employment program, the facility-based program in um, in Utah. And she'd been there for a couple of years and definitely decided that she would prefer to be working in the community. So she opted into what we were doing and, again, kind of came along for the ride and was willing to kind of let us figure out, this, is this going to work or, you know, the different strategies and kind of bringing them all together. And um, Carolina had a, a, a strong interest area that came out through discovery. So we knew that working with children was a really big um, interest area of hers. And so we were able to get her into one internship, and we learned a lot about not just her interest area and her skills, but again, that work environment. And I think of there, there's, there's so many little nuggets that, we like to, that I'd like to be able to share with you today, but certainly thinking about ideal work conditions for individuals is just going to make or break anything, that, you know, any kind of work experience that they have. And bringing that to bear and really focusing on that is just hugely important. And so, for, again, for Carolina, she had one internship. We learned an awful lot. And again, we, we would never say that she failed it or you know, that things went bad. It, we just learned more about what was going to work for her and what was not going to work for her. And um, she's now working at Clearfield Aquatic Center in, uh, in Clearfield, Utah. And I just got the two-minute warning. I cannot believe that. Uh, anyway, this is Gary. And Gary also opted into Pathways from the Facility-Based uh, Employment Program in Utah. And Gary probably is going to get our um, I don't know, most mature participant award. He's 60-something years young and had actually been in the facility program for over 40 years. So he's also going to get, for me, the Perseverance Award because clearly he still wanted something different. And he, and he chose to kind of um, uh, come along for the ride with us. So he actually had one internship and had to go on medical leave uh, for a little while and then 
when he was feeling better, was able to come back to the um, facility program and opt back into to Pathways because we try to stay with folks as long as they want to stay with us. And then we were able to get him the second internship at Zero Manufacturing where he was ultimately offered employment. And one of the things when you think about using, again, this expanded discovery approach, one of the things that's really um, great about it and looking at people from a different lens is thinking about if staff have worked with someone like Gary or anyone else in facility empl employment for, let's say, you know, 5, 10, 15, in his case, 40 years, they're probably only seeing a certain side of Gary and they've gotten to know him and they've gotten to think, well, this is who Gary is. And what, what discovery and then expanded discovery lets us do is give staff the room to see competency differently so that when they're out in the community and they're, and they're applying skills or doing things, that we, we're giving them a whole different strategy to approach Gary or anyone like him um, so that they can, they can see those skills and abilities. And I would say the same thing with the employer. The, the internship approach has worked incredibly well with employers um, in the same vein, giving the employers the opportunity to see that person and see what they can contribute to them in, in their place of work. So um, as I said, in Gary's case, he was offered employment and he's been, I guess, um, a regular employee there for over, um, over a month now at Zero Manufacturing. So I'm pretty much out of time. I guess the, the one thing I'd like to say, I was going to chat a little bit more about the impact of the EPTA and how we're seeing employers respond to it. Brian mentioned very briefly some of the feedback that Mathematica is getting. But I think anecdotally what we're seeing is that as it relates to bringing employers to the table and talking about building a partnership with them and, and engaging them in the initial conversation around what we're doing and what we're all about, the EPTA really does seem to make a difference. I mean, and it, as part of that larger um, group of strategies that we're using to, to work with employers and think about that demand side. But as we're able to get folks into internships, we're hearing more and more that the feedback from employer is that actually the EPTA really wasn't a decision maker for me around offering employment. It was much more important about en with engaging in the first place. But once I saw this person in my place of work and I could see that they could add so much value because of all the you know the upfront strategies that we're employing, then they're saying you know what I would have I would offer employment regardless of it, this being on the table or not. So I'm out of time. So I'm going to have to skip this slide. This is. Karina, and she's got a great story too, just like everybody. Before I hand over to Gina, I, and I just wanted to say um, that, uh, just express our appreciation to Mathematica for all the great help they've been to us, and the guidance and support they've been, uh, given us over the past, I don't know, five years now that we've been working on this. So as um, David mentioned, Gina's going to be talking about data. And because we're all about wanting systems change and to really move the needle forward beyond just a couple of pilot sites, but really get um, some great movement and, and opportunity available to people with significant disabilities. The data element is so important to us. So we, Brian gave you the background, I gave you some personal stories, but this is the whole arc of what we're all about and what Gina's going to share. So we're really excited to share this with you, the good, the not so good, the, the fabulous, and the stuff that kind of has some warts and we've got to work on, um, because this is how we think we can move towards really some, some really major systems change. So thank you. All right, so I'm not going to thank anyone because Teresa and Brian have thanked the world already. <laughs> Let's get right into this. Um, so as they said, uh, Mathematica is doing an evaluation of the Utah site so far, and um, I think we're going to start evaluating the other three sites at some point. So what I'm going to talk about today are some very early findings of the experiences of the Utah program during the first three years of, of operation. And so just to give a quick overview of what the evaluation is looking at, we're looking at the, how it was implemented, who participates, the cost of the program, and outcomes of the participants. And it's based on data from, administrative data from the program, application baseline data on the participants, follow-up surveys done at 6, 12, and 24 months, and then interviews with staff, participants, and employers. And again, it's just the Utah program, um, and in this presentation, in this early findings, we're just looking at the first four cohorts that went through. It's, it's only 67 individuals, um, and it, it, there is no comparison group. It's looking at their pre-program uh, uh, experiences compared to their post, because as Dave said before, this is a pilot. It was testing the feasibility of this approach. So, uh, and given the small sample sizes, it really wasn't feasible to do a more rigorous um, uh, evaluation at this point. 
But it is set up, as Brian mentioned at one point, that participants are randomly selected in, so, so it does have the potential to do more rigorous evaluation in the future. Okay, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about eligibility and participant characteristics, service delivery outcomes, and a few participant outcomes at this point. So um, I think they've mentioned a little bit that the eligibility in Utah is they have to have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder or intellectual or developmental disability. They need to be age 18 or over and reside in Davis County, Utah to be eligible from the program for this program. And they're taking uh, referrals from three sources, and these have also come out in Teresa's presentation. Uh, the facility-based employment program at the Pioneer Adult Rehabilitation Center, or PARC, and that's actually, PARC is the organization that's implementing the Pathways to Careers in, in Utah. And then the Davis County School District's transition programs. And then the, the final group is the Medicaid waiver waiting list. It's a, a waiver for community supports for people with intellectual disabilities. So the, um, I'm just going to talk about all here. Uh, the applications, they solicited from these three groups and got, they, they identified about 547 people, at least across the first four cohorts, who would be eligible for the program from these groups. From that group, they got about 133 applications, or about a 24 percent uh, a response rate uh, from, from those individuals. And they randomly selected 72 from, from them, and five declined the offer of services after they were selected. Um, so there were 67 who accepted and, uh, and went through intake in the program. And after intake, nine, or about 13%, have, had since dropped out for a variety of reasons. So uh, the participant characteristics, just really quickly, uh, nearly all were white, non-Hispanic, which reflects the demographic makeup of Davis County, Utah. Uh, never married, and nearly all were receiving either SSI or SSDI. Average age of 25, a little more male than female, 60% male. Most had a high school certificate or diploma. The bulk of the ones who didn't were the, the kids coming out of the transition program. A few had, a, a very small percentage, had um, education beyond high school. And most uh, lived with their parent or guardian. And all had significant disabilities since childhood, even many in addition to the intellectual disabilities um, that were the eligibility requirement. They had um, speech, physical disabilities, vision, hearing issues, a whole variety of, 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 of impairments. Um, so just some vocational characteristics at baseline. About a third were attending school, um, and a third were working for pay at the time they came into the program. And uh, most of those attending school, nearly all were those coming from the transition program. And most of those that were actually employed at the time they were coming in came from the facility-based um, employment program at PARC. So I'm going to go through a little bit of statistics here on, on the service delivery outcomes just to give you a sense of what's involved in the initial discovery, the internships, and the EPTA. So um, the average is over, uh, I think it wasn't, all 67 have not yet gone, completed initial discovery. I think there's maybe 10 or so still in that. But of those who have completed, on average, um, it took about 14 weeks, and they did about 17 different activities lasting about an hour and a half each to get to know the individual and their capabilities in different environments. And I think Therese has given you some examples of, of that. Um, then there's quite a long wait, at least in these first four cohorts, to get into their first internship, an average of 17 weeks. And part of that's because the program was starting to roll out, and they needed to get more employers on board, and also just the process of matching, getting the person to match to the appropriate environment, the appropriate employer, the appropriate job, it takes, it takes a long time. So um, this average of 17 weeks wait. But then um, after getting in, there was, among this group, there's been an average of two internships uh, per participant, but they range anywhere from like one to five. Some people have had up to five at this point as data through October, um, and some are still ongoing, um, have not gotten permanent employment. And it was an average of about nine weeks per internship, and one interesting thing, the staff spend time on site with the individual and with the employer. And it's a, on average about 31% of the internship time is, has project staff on site, job coaching or doing other kinds of supports. 
Um, but that number is really big in the first month and then drops a lot in, in the months after that. So it's like up to 60% time in the first couple of, or first month and then it drops to more like 10 or 20% more just checking in. Um, probably some of that is unnecessary checking in, but they're still doing it as part of the, the, the process. So um, they have recruited to date 55 employers affiliated with the program to offer internships. And um, so far, 76 internships have been completed. And out of those 76, there's been 25 offers of employment, so about a one in three chance of getting a job offer if you um, go through an internship. And 15 of those 25 were accepted. So here's an example of where informed choice might be coming in. Um, they didn't, some of these people didn't want the jobs. You know, they did the internship, they know what it's about, and they didn't want the job. So some of them were turned down. Um, the ones that were accepted were just under $10 per hour on average, um, or a little over $1,100 per month. And that number is kind of about half of the, the jobs were full-time and half were not full-time. And so the full-time jobs are kind of skewing it up, that average up, and the, you know, the, um, the part-time jobs, you know, it's probably a 50-50 split. So 1100s probably seems a little high for, but it, it's um, mostly being driven by those full-time job folks. And the, those EPTA payments, I, I know we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but um, basically if the, it, it, it works a little bit like the work opportunity tax credit or the, even the ticket to work EM payments. You know, you hit, you employ people at certain milestones or making a certain amount of money, you get a monthly um, payment from the program. And the payment's higher if the person's working more or if the person's participating in the, an employer health insurance plan. Um, so at, with these, the folks that have made it through the first four, co four cohorts, they've only been making payments on seven participants, and those are generally those full-time participants, and none of them are participating in their employer health plan. They've, some of them have been offered it, but they aren't participating in it, and I can imagine there's a, a number of reasons why. Um, but they, to date, have paid about $45,000 in these in pay, uh, EPTA payments to employers. So you can't see the slide, probably, but it's in your packet. I just wanted to give a flavor of the 55 employers and all the kinds of internships they've offered. There's a few at the bottom that haven't yet offered an internship. They've been newly recruited. But I just wanted to have that in front of you so you could see the wide range of job types. And it is in your packet. And I apologize to people on the web who can't see it. Um, so employer views the pathway. We haven't gotten to talk to a lot of employers at this point, but we will do more in the future. Um, but what we've heard about at least getting recruited, coming to the, the, the program, um, they want to know what types of disabilities the participants have. They're a little bit worried about safety, safety of the individual working in their environment or safety of other people working with them. Um, they have mixed views about the importance of the EPTA, as, as Teresa said. I think we've only run into uh, one employer who thought it was a key feature to bring them to the table, but others thought it was a very, uh, it was a good feature to have because it legitimized the, the program in some way. Um, you know, made it seem like it was more of a partnership. And, <clears throat> but the main uh, motive for re, uh, joining the program or, or uh, developing a relationship with Pathways was they wanted to <coughs> contribute to the community, give back to the community. And they thought this was giving back to the community. So in terms of their experiences with actually having internships or employment, um, they really appreciated the ability to try out the participants with little risk to them. So the program is paying the, the wages for the internship. So they don't have that, the financial risk uh, uh, during the paid internship. But they also are providing all these on-the-job on supports. Like I said, an average of 31% of the internship time staff are on site with them, training them, teaching them. So it didn't interfere with the productivity of the rest of the business or that kind of thing. Or if they had questions or issues, this person was available um, to talk to them. And in the employment process, um, they appreciated receiving information about what this person needed to succeed. Now, one of the things they do when the person goes into permanent employment is they provide like a long-term support plan and what are the conditions for success 
to the employer. And I had one employer tell me he wished he got this on all his employees because, you know, it just said these are just little, you know, they're not big things generally, you know, loud noises or needs uh, written cues instead of verbal cues or, you know, little things like that that are, uh, contribute to the success. Um, so they appreciated getting that information. So real quickly, just looking at three of the key outcomes, and only at 24 months, we are measuring these at 6, 12, and 24, but you know, at the 6 and the 12 month, it's mostly the, the effect of the internship, the paid internships. But here, um, at 24 months, and we only have 27 people who have made it through to the 24 month survey at this point. So the sample size is tiny and not a lot, you know, um, I, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in this. I imagine as all 67 or more go through, the numbers may change. But 44% um, were employed at, tw at two years after intake, and that actually sh is no change or a slight decline from what they were at application at baseline. <clears throat> so not a big change in employment. And if you recall, a chunk of these folks were in the park facility-based employment, so that's going to dampen um, the employment rate somewhat. Um, but nonetheless, not a big impact on actually being, the probability of being employed. Um, but in terms of monthly earnings, they went up quite markedly and increased, well, they were $391 on average at, at um, and that includes the people who weren't working. This is across, oops, excuse me, the whole group, not just the employed people. So there was a $391 increase in the average across all of them, which uh, is a uh, a change of about $235, or about a 200% increase in average earnings across the whole group. And at average uh, monthly SSI and SSDI benefits declined by, on average, $161 per month, or about a 22% decline in, in benefits. So um, just to summarize, the, uh, there's a significant investment in, in this project and its approach. Um, to provide this choice-based alternative to sheltered employment for people with intellectual disabilities. A lot of staff training went into um, learning how to do the discovery. A lot of effort went into recruit, uh, recruiting employers and matching to internships. And the time the participants spend, you know, 14 weeks initial discovery, 17 weeks waiting for an internship, nine weeks in one or more internships, it's a lot of time. And they are showing some evidence of success at 24 months. Average earnings increased by 200%. And as I said, the monthly SSI and DI benefits declined by 22%. Um, but is there the potential for long-run savings in this program? Well, this is something we're looking into. We're doing a cost study on this, but it's not complete uh, right now. But just thinking about the 22% reduction in the federal cash benefit, uh, disability benefits, um, that translates into about $39,000 in lifetime cumulative benefits based on other studies that I've done. So if they could actually, if this is representative of an impact, like I said, these aren't impacts, we don't have a control group, but if they could get a 10, 20% reduction in, um, in benefits, there's quite a bit of money there to invest upfront in services to people if there's long-term success. So just a few other thoughts. Um, like I said, it's amenable to a regular evaluation, but they might want to think, is 24 months even long enough to measure the success, given how long it takes to go through the process? Um, and really, is that, you know, to show long-term impact of the program, you might want to go longer. Uh, looking at employment rates may not be the right measure of success for this population, especially if your goal is to transition people out of a sheltered workshop. They're already employed. So it's not like a typical employment program where we look at the employment rate as a success indicator. And also, how do you measure informed choice? That's very difficult. Um, so a final issue is um, the sustainability of this. And I won't go into all of this, but um, it, it remains a, a question. But I will say the Utah program has um, been successful in, in getting some long-term funding sources on board. And if the program can continue to show successes in in terms of VR referrals, they're changing the population they focus on, um, then there is the potential between Medicaid funding and VR funding in the states to, to sustain this program in the long term. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gina. While we're waiting for Chris to get to the microphone, I want to just remind the <coughs> webinar audience that we'd love to get your questions. Uh, so please, if you haven't already, go ahead and submit your questions now. 
And uh, when Chris is done, we'll go into our Q&A session and we'll alternate your questions for, with those from in the room. So Chris, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I am really honored to be here today to represent the Department of Labor and the Office of Disability Employment Policy and talk about the exciting stuff that you guys have been hearing about and that's happening out in Utah and in the other sites that this project is, um, is working in and as well as other things that are happening around the country. I wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about the policy context within which this is happening. Um, for those of you who don't know ODAP, just real quickly, a little advertisement. Um, we are uh, an assistant secretary-led office at the U.S. Department of Labor. We're the only assistant secretary-led office across federal government that focuses solely and specifically on employment and disability. And our, our goal is really to be a catalyst to align policy across the government and as it's implemented in the states um, to, to make sure that people with disabilities are able to have the choice of competitive integrated employment um, as they uh, choose their work lives. I'm also excited to be here because the people that are involved in this project I have just the highest regard for. I know their names have been mentioned already, but in addition to Brian and, and Therese Martin-Gary, Mike Callahan, or Siva Shumpert, these are people who have been change agents in the world of disability employment for decades. And so when we first became um, familiar with this project, um, it was with great excitement to hear about what their latest thing was, if you will. And um, we had an opportunity to go out and visit. Um, and uh, we're very excited about the preliminary findings that Gina has, has spoken about. What I want to do today is to just do a little bit of the policy context for why some of the things that they are doing are so very relevant. And I selected three areas. There were others that I could have put up here, but I only have 10 minutes. So um, I chose these three, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, better known as WEOA, the Advisory Committee on Increasing Competitive Integrative Employment for Individuals with Disabilities, sometimes referred to as A-C-I-C-I-E-I-D, which does actually roll off your tongue after you've said it a few times. And um, finally, in employment first. Um, within all of these areas, there is a focus on moving from segregation to integration to increasing choice for individuals with disabilities seeking employment and um, for um, really making a, a good match, if you will, between the individual seeking employment and the employment that they actually end up getting. The Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, WEOA, was reauthorized in July of 2014. This was the first major reauthorization of workforce development policy in over a decade. They'd really been working on it a very long time. And we are so excited because throughout the law, throughout the reauthorization, disability has been elevated. There are disability amendments throughout and particularly in Title I and Title IV of the law. Title I really is the authorizing language uh, for what ultimately becomes the um, workforce system as, it, as it's implemented across the nation through American Job Centers, sometimes known as one-stop career centers. Title IV of the WIOA is what we all know of as the VR Act, the Rehab Act. And, and so there really is, um, uh, not emerging, but uh, an increased focus, not just on disability when the, in the early parts of the act, but increased partnership, not only between the Title I programs and VR, but with other partner systems that are out there in the states that really need to be working collaboratively and cooperatively to make the employment uh, search experience a good one for, for people. I've put up here on the slide just some of the highlights that are included um, in the law, the, the, the new financial literacy authority. Why is that important? Well, if you're moving from either non-work to work, or you're moving from segregated work where you might have earned sub-minimum wage to a real wage out in the community, you certainly need to know about banking and managing money, et cetera. Partnerships, increasing partnerships, not just 
between VR and the, and the, the public workforce system, but what other non-traditional partners can now be brought to the table, partners that are really uh, essential, uh, mental health, developmental disability, um, Medicaid, can be brought to the table um, in a way that they hadn't been before. Um, Section 188 of the WIOA relates to non-discrimination. And because of the increase in disability language throughout the law, it makes the 188 infrastructure, if you will, of the law just really critical for people with disabilities because um, we now have um, a lot of hooks, if you will, for helping the system to provide meaningful, effective service to youth and adults with disabilities. The law includes, for the first time, a definition of customized employment. Um, all the things that, that Brian and Therese were talking about around discovery and, and customizing as needed um, can now be done more officially uh, uh, in the language of the law. Could have been done before, but it was not as obvious. And so now we have, again, the infrastructure to help the system do that and for people to be asking for it more concretely. And very critically, there are limitations on use of subminimum wage in the new Section 511 of the WIOA. Um, this will limit um, the use of sheltered employment and subminimum wages so that it really is truly the last uh, opportunity that is even considered for youth or adults with disabilities as they are moving from school to work. Um, and um, with the goal, the clear goal of competitive integrated employment as the, um, the first choice uh, where we should be looking. There are other words that I didn't uh, put up here. The focus on career pathways and, and making sure that people are being put into jobs where they do have some potential for growth. The, um, the customer-centered design is a major element of the WIOA reauthorization. And these are things that have been a part of the world of disability employment for decades. I kind of feel sometimes like the best of what we have learned in disability employment can be really helpful to everyone. Customer-centered design certainly being one of those elements. If you're interested in learning more about the specifics of the provisions of WIOA from a disability perspective, um, we have a TA center that we fund at ODEP, the LEAD Center, which is uh, over at the National Disability Institute, and they did a wonderful brief that summarizes the highlights of the disability amendments in WIOA. I believe that Mathematica has um, made some copies of that brief, and it's out in the, um, in the lobby area, and you can get, um, get a copy. But certainly some of these changes to the WIOA, customer-centered design, customization as needed, et cetera, highly relevant to the project that we're talking about today. Um, part of the WIOA was the establishment of an advisory committee on increasing competitive integrated employment for individuals with disabilities. This is in Title IV. This directs the Secretary of Labor to implement an advisory committee that includes multiple federal agencies, including Employment and Training Administration, Wage and Hour Division, ODEP, Voc Rehab, Social Security Administration, Administration for Community Living, and uh, CMS, uh, Medicaid, as well as multiple national experts from across the country representing different stakeholder groups, including employers and providers and individuals with disabilities, um, to, to look at ways to increase employment opportunities for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities or other individuals with significant disabilities in competitive integrated employment. Two, use of the certificate program carried out under Section 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act, which um, allows uh, employers to pay less than minimum wage to some individuals with disabilities under some circumstances and finally, ways to improve oversight of the use of the 14C certificate. So the advisory committee is very busy. They have a final report that has to be submitted to Congress by September 15th of this year. They have preliminary recommendations that they put out already. They are looking at capacity building. They are looking at what needs to be done to um, more effectively ensure that in the transition process, young people have the choice to do some of the kinds of things around apprenticeship and, and other opportunities that um, that uh, Therese and Brian talked about um, today. 
and then what to do, of course, with the 14C certificate program and um, its relevance as they move to, to the future. You can follow the work of the advisory committee by going to the ODEP website. That's uh, www.dol.gov, usdol.gov backslash ODEP, and then you can find the, um, the advisory committee pretty, pretty quickly. And my buzzer just rang, so I'm going to have to talk very quickly about Employment First. Employment First is a movement sweeping the country, and it's all about making integrated competitive employment the first priority for youth and adults with significant disabilities, not just developmental disabilities, but any significant disability. ODEP has been implementing an initiative called the Employment First State Leadership Mentoring Program, where we are kind of matching subject matter experts and states, helping them kind of ask the tough questions. What do we need to do to align policy and funding in our state so that it can support movement of people away from segregation into integrated community uh, into integrated community jobs. We currently are in 19 states uh, providing intensive TA. We have a community of practice that um, has 45 states that are participating. Each state has a team of six state agencies that include public labor, voc rehab, education, um, mental health, Medicaid, and DD. And they are required partners that are coming together looking at how to align their policy. How can they make it so that a provider, for example, who wants to be transforming their business model from one of segregation to one of integration or inclusion, how can the, the public policy infrastructure be supportive to help make that happen? Um, what I have on this slide are four briefs that ODEP recently put out and are available on our Lead Center website. The, um, the link is at the bottom of the page. The first brief discusses federal policy across those systems that I just mentioned and what particular areas of public policy support uh, competitive integrated employment right now that can be used as policy hooks, as policy links, as you will, across education and VR and, and workforce and um, Social Security and, and mental health and, and Medicaid. The second brief is the federal legal framework that supports CIE. Um, this brief discusses the recent settlement agreements from the Department of Justice in places like Ohio and Rhode Island, and it will give you a lot of information about what's happening with our colleagues in the enforcement agencies. The third brief, Criteria for Performance Excellence in Employment First Systems Change and Provider Transformation, is putting forward the model, if you will, that includes many of the elements that were discussed today in the Pathways to Career Project to help providers uh, transform, if you will. And finally, federal resources available to support state employment first efforts. This is really a where can you look to find dollars in particular discretionary grant dollars and some of the initiatives that have been funded in, um, in this area. Finally, um, one quote, and then I'm going to sit down for looking forward. And this is a quote from a man by the name of Samuel, Samuel Gridley Howe from 1866. Some of you may recognize his name as the quote unquote father of special education. And back in 1866, he said, as men and women unwittingly and sometimes unwillingly reveal their character and even their secret motives of action by the sort of language which they use. So the generations reveal the prevailing ideas of the men who lived in them by the works which they leave behind them. And the works that are left behind are not just art and literature and architecture, although those certainly are, are great works, but they are also the public policies of our nation and the infrastructure that is put in place to implement those policies and the goals of those policies, such as moving from segregation to integration and recognizing that with a very good match between the individual and the employer needs, you can have a very successful employment outcome for people who previously had erroneously been considered to be unemployable. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have 20 minutes or so left for questions and answers. And um, advance the slide. Yes, I can do that. All right. So we'll take the first question. Yes, right here. 
Uh, it, it may introduce yourself and, uh, and wait for the mic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Haley uh, from Office of Policy Development and Research at U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So um, I was wondering about the employment payroll tax adjustment. Is that uh, for the only for the internship, or is that for the entire um, tenure of the of of the the employee in the in, in the workplace, and uh, that's question number one. Um, question number two, why um, exclude people with disabilities other than the intellectual and, um, and, and developmental disabilities from, from the, 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 the startup? Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll take the first so question and, uh, and, and I'll let you. Before you go, make sure your mic's on. I got you, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the EPTA is modeled to represent um, a pass-through from the savings represented to the federal government from a person leaving disability roles to the employer to provide assistance and long-term supports. As, as practiced in Utah right now, there's a five-year, not guarantee, but there's a five-year promise from us to employers that we will simulate and model that that, that pass-through, that deduction. Our purpose in evaluating it and doing it is to drive public policy. Um, Martin Gary, who, who envisioned this, would like to see changes at the Office of Management and Budget that would like to create a permanent tax deduction for employers that hire people with disabilities and a strong argument that it long-term saves the federal government a lot of money. And in the program, it's not offered during the internship, just for permanent yeah. employment. Yeah. And then to your second question around um, the focus of the, the cohorts in Utah and, and, and elsewhere. Um, we, so just to clarify, we are working with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and autism as a primary diagnosis um, in Utah and at several of the other sites. And it wasn't so much to exclude others, but because we know that individuals with intellectual disabilities um, have, I guess, historically been overlooked so many times, and they tend to be the ones that are the one that are sitting in the in the facility-based programs more than any other group of individuals. We really wanted to concentrate our effort with them and say, if we can come up with the right strategies that can help this group of individuals effectively move into community employment, then we probably can then extrapolate and and use some of those same strategies for other um, folks with disabilities. So it wasn't so much to be exclusionary, but really to target a group that has for years posed a challenge to the system and to CRPs and providers around, you know, getting folks into those better job options. Sure. Thank Carmen, you. do we have one from the web? Yes, we do. We have many, actually. Um, <clears throat> this question is for Therese. Um, it is from Russ Thielen in Utah. Yeah. Is your mic on? I can't hear you. Can you hear me better now? How about now? Um, I will speak loudly. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk about how the vocational rehabilitation programs in Utah have been partners with Pathways to Careers, in both in terms of Utah but also other sites? Absolutely. Um, so in Utah, we have obviously more um, experience, and we've been out working there for over three years. And actually, uh, VR in Utah was a great partner from day one. Um, they really, they, they got it, they wanted to work with us, they helped to, you know, even um, envision some of the additional features that we needed to include. And uh, one of which, the, one, one resource from day one that they provided is actually benefits counseling. So um, they offered that to all of the participants, whether they were actually VR clients or not. And so everyone has multiple opportunities to receive that benefits counseling through the professional um, providers that they, that they fund through VR. In addition to that, uh, very early on in the project in Utah, we were able to start to work with the, with the agency and the staff there around uh, looking at some payments that could start to come in for the services and, and the outcomes that we were getting. So they are starting to fund and cover a lot of the expenses around the discovery phase, uh, supports on the internships. And there's even some conversation around could they cover some of the costs for uh, internship wages. And in fact, the, the uh, Medicaid state agency is talking to us about that now as well. So. And we're hitting some wonderful milestone outcomes, and VR has been willing and, and very interested in working with us on and helping the project team out there to start to um, bring in those milestone payments and, and 
both from the VR perspective, but also from the Ticket to Work program. So uh, phenomenal partnership. And I'd say in the other project sites, um, we definitely have had a lot of great conversations. I think in Detroit, we're seeing a little bit more of a, a commitment from um, VR to work with us and to um, look at covering costs for uh, discovery. And then with the other state agencies, it's just a, a process of continuing to make them aware of what we're doing and how this might really um, integrate into and perhaps even enhance the services that they can provide in their state. So thank you. Way in the back, we have a. Uh, hang on just a second. We'll get to the mic. <laughs> Hi. Uh, ah. <laughs> I'm Jamie Wilson from the Office of Management and Budget. And I actually had a question kind of regarding how much you were tracking kind of um, the application and utilization of work incentives, so as well as how often there was ticket milestone payments if they were using subsidies or special conditions during those periods, and if you were able to track those or if you were planning to in future evaluations? We definitely are tracking the, the ticket payments and the milestones that they're achieving with that. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, we haven't been looking as closely um, at some of the other work incentives that might be um, in utilization. I know there's some transportation supports that are being brought to bear. And um, I think even that we saw in the in the latest statistics that food stamp usage had gone up, or not food stamp, yes. yeah. food stamp usage. So we think that that's probably an outgrowth of actually benefits counseling and that people are being made aware of some additional benefits that they didn't know that they could access. Uh, but it certainly would be something that we could easily go back and look at and, and maybe target as another, um, you know, look in with the data collection. So. So the team, are, the teams out there are loving that I'm saying we're going to collect more data on something else. Well, at, at one point we had the hope that we could um, do a match with the SSA data, so that wouldn't be a, you know, a, a burden on the actual program and so forth. Um, we've done it on other Source America projects, but I think the environment has gotten a little more difficult, so I'm not sure that's going to happen. <laughs> Carmen. Yes. So this question is not directed to any specific panelists, but it comes from Catherine Rucker. Um, and she asks, what program refinements or improvements might actually help ensure that, patient, that participants uh, move through the discovery process faster in a more timely way um, and that their experience better translates into longer term employment opportunities? Can I take that one? Um, well, you know, we're learning a lot. There's no doubt. And, and I think one of the things that we've, we've learned that it's uh, very beneficial, and, and a couple of the project sites have started to do this, to bring in um, other people than just the project staff into some of the training that we're doing so that we can, we can actually share the information and knowledge or at least start to build capacity beyond just the project team. Because we have experienced some turnover, and I think that that's part of the reason why um, there, you know, maybe there's a, a length of time there in discovery. Um, that we otherwise wouldn't have. So related to the turnover and, and how do we continue that, the link with capacity within a, within a project site, that's one of the things that we're doing. And um, it, it, we're just trying to, to uh, refine the work that we're doing and help them um, target time spent with folks in discovery towards certain activities and certain outcomes. But there certainly is you know, more that we could do. I don't know, Brian, if you want to add. Um, I would think that Teresa's um, discussion briefly of turnover and, and entry-level staff and the Pathways Initiative sites, um, there's long-standing issues around those, around those certainly problems. Um, our goal is to put a certification program in place. Our goal is to certainly further professionalize entry-level staff as it relates to people who directly perform this work and try to, and, and, and try to certainly rise, raise their incomes raise their visibility, raise their skill levels in a way that will engage them longer term in these kinds of activities. Yeah, and I guess I'd also say related to that, I actually don't mind when you look at best practice that the amount of time that we're spending with folks in discovery, that doesn't, you know, that is not a, as much of a, you know, a bell ringer, if you will, um, when you look at our work and what other best practices would say. I think the issue for us is really around the time between uh, when initial discovery ends and when we get people into that, that first internship. And that's 17 weeks. It feels very, very long, and that weighs on me quite a bit. Um, and related to that, we've, we've done a lot to look in and see what can we do, how can we, how can we you know, bring that time frame down. One of the things is getting these employer partners on board. As Brian was saying, we, we go out before a project site starts and we tr start to build those partnerships, but it takes time. And, and I'd interrupt to just say, and 
just because there is a pool, and in Utah right now there's a large pool yeah. of employers, but customi customization doesn't demand that we try to match our people with that pool. If customization right. takes us to the fact that these people need something else, then that employer has to be found in the community, that, that outreach has to be right. performed, and that match has to be refined. And that, that 17 weeks doesn't weigh just heavily on my colleague. It weighs <laughs> heavily on everybody involved yeah, in that place. Yeah. And this is Chris. Um, just one of the reasons why it's going to be so interesting to, for Gina to finish the, the research um, is to really be able to look more long term at the sustainability of the employment because then that 17 weeks might kind of fade in terms of if you get a longer term right. employment. Uh, and you know, it's really interesting. There is a book that came out a couple of years ago called Workforce of One by the Harvard Business Press which is a generic HR book on best practices in HR and how to get the best out of your employee match. And it's all about customizing. Right, right. It's all about customizing. Yeah. So yeah, and, and, maybe and it will become a thing of the right. future, right? <laughs> right? Exactly, exactly. Thank you, Chris. Joanne? Oops. Hang on, Joanne. Oh, sorry. Joanne Schneider, Crystalist Collaborations. Um, I have. I wanted to ask Therese and Brian to expand on a, one piece of this and then a very quick question for Gina. Um, I ran a very similar program to this for people on welfare in the early 90s, 20% of which had disabilities, including many of the aspects of the contracts, et cetera. And one of the things we found is that the key here was the nature of the case management, which was an interaction between the employer and the person and the case manager. And so I'm wondering if you could talk more about that and more about the training you give to people to do that. The second piece, which has got huge amounts of literature backing it up, is those mentors slash buddies in the workplace. And I'm wondering if you could talk more about how that's done. Gina, I'm wondering if you're talking to coworkers, and if you are, what you're finding. So. Can we? Go back a couple slides to, show, to respond to her question, to Joanne's question. Is that possible? Uh, to the org chart slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so just to get started, um, I don't even know what slide number it is. I'm sorry. Uh, we, the way the teams are structured um, at all the, the pilot sites, we have uh, obviously a project manager. And then we, every site has at least one career navigator. And the career navigator is responsible for essentially the, the case management and interaction with the, the participant and the family and kind of walking that person through. Obviously, facilitating discovery is their number one job, but they're really the one that kind of keeps um, tabs with the individual throughout the arc of their experience with us and, and even through the expanded discovery and career development component. That's, that's their role. Every site also has an employer relations coordinator. And our, our employer relations coordinators, well, what you'll see is we've kind of broken apart all the different elements of customized employment, and we've given people certain specific roles within the larger structure of customized employment. So we said our career navigators are going to primarily focus on, on um, for the sake of conversation, discovery. Our employer relations coordinators are going to be the ones building the employer partnerships, understanding the community of employers, what jobs are available, what could be customized, and working very closely with the career navigator to match during the internship and employment phase based on what we know about those parties. And then we have um, what we call internship facilitators. And those are the folks who are on the job site, like they're like job coaches, and they work with the individual. They, they facilitate systematic instruction and some of the other strategies that we're using. So at different intervals in the process, different people are responsible for collecting different information for the purposes of, of employment success. So I would say during the, the internship, and early employment phase, it really becomes the internship facilitator's responsibility to feed appropriate information back to the career navigator who's then looking at the profile, expanding the support plan, and, and again, getting closer and closer to that focus. Um, our training is bedrocked in Mark Golden Associates training. So we have, if there are, let's say there are eight training modules that we're training on in the, in the, the Pathways Initiative right now, and we're still, it's, we're not sure if it's eight or nine, because it's a lot there. But three of them are, are core Mark Golden Associates training. So discovery, systematic instruction, and customized job development are really the three, three of the core trainings. And Mike Callahan and Narciva Shumpert provide most of that training for the project teams throughout you know, um, the, the startup phase and, and then ongoing technical support in those areas. But the training is very extensive because then we bring in the whole component of expanded discovery and the internships and negotiating with employers a little bit differently through the course of 
both the, you know, the systematically customizing employment outcomes approach that we really want to have a good scan of all these different employers and what they have available. Um, so there's a lot of technical support that goes into um, the, the supporting the project sites as well. So, I, think it's, I think it's a slightly different take on traditional case management. And um, I think one of the things that drove that variance was the idea that if these three, this employer engagement, this sort of training component, this discovery, th those are such such difficult skills to grasp. You're not going to pick up any of this stuff at a two or a three day training. You need to professionalize these people in a way that make them really responsible, and really professional. And to try to make one person all of these yeah. three things yeah. just was a direction we, st we thought early on we wanted to avoid. Yeah. Gina? And then there was a mentor question. Oh, yeah. Um, to date, we have not. We've done very limited with the employers, partly because we wanted to give the employers some experience. And, you know, not many have had that many internships. Um, but there is a plan to do more development of that down the road. Any mentors at the project site? Yeah, you talked about the yeah. training. Joanne, I want to interrupt. I need to give somebody on. We have a lot of questions over here. We have a couple minutes left. So. We do. We have yeah. quite a few mm -hmm. questions on the webinar. Um, this isn't for any specific panelists, but it's in reference to WIOA. Um, a new common measure is measurable skills gain. Um, how can the Pathways strategy be included in American job centers and used to show progress for individuals participating in this strategy, specifically demonstrating that people with disabilities are moving into these career pathways? Well, this is Chris. I'll take a shot at that, and I'll do it by saying that the Employment and Training Administration has established some cross-agency teams as they look at how to implement different aspects of, of the law. <clears throat> and certainly, the performance measurement is, is huge. And there is a lot of dialogue um, around that right now. Um, we at ODEP are bringing issues like the one that you've just raised to those conversations. And so I'm hoping that we'll have something that's more specific and concrete that we can say, can say down the road as the WIOA continues to roll out. Uh, state plans are due to Department of Labor by um, April 1st, and, um, and it's all kind of fitting together into a, a rollout plan of which performance measurement is huge. Okay, is there another one in the room, or we can take another one from the, I think we have time. Go ahead, Carmen. Can you talk a little bit more about how the Utah model can be replicated in other states? Sure. I'll, I'll start. And I'll, right. let, I'll let you riff off of that. I, the, in, in terms of replication, I would, I'm, I'm going to assume that there's not going to be a Source America money coming into that. So we, 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 we <laughs> or, or limited Source America money coming into that. And that would mean support that we would provide around training, and that would mean certainly support that we want to provide around evaluation. And then I think it's breaking up the other components into, for example, in, in Detroit we have some agreements with local VR offices that they're simply going to build, they're simply going to reimburse for discovery like they would traditional assessment. There's certainly money built into the VR and, and some of the waiver dollars that would allow for supports on the job. And you know you hear a lot of talk about blending, and you hear a lot of talk about grading the funds, but th that's that's the challenge. I think that the support from um, the institute at Source America would be in both supporting evaluation and then trying to build partnerships around training. And we're open to any of those conversations. Yeah. Trace? And as, as Brian mentioned earlier, oh, okay, oh, um, sorry. Uh, we're in the process of trying to ramp up a, a certification and standards methodology that would allow more sites to adopt, the, you know, to have staff trained and be certified in these different strategies and then become, you know, proficient, if you will, in, in providing these different services. And we could look at, you know, how different sites are doing based on meeting certain standards, based on principles within the model. So we, we're definitely looking at, we're in, the, in the early stages of developing that. And we're learning a lot around replication by the three additional demonstration sites. So a lot of the info that they're giving us about what's 
you know, how's this feeling in Detroit versus Utah, Virginia versus Utah is really helpful for us as we're trying to figure out what, are, what is the complement of, of training, support, services, technical assistance, and of course Brian touched on funding that we need to have together in this to help more sites adopt the practice. And this is Chris, I want to just um, augment that a little bit by saying the, these, these practices are now a part of the WIOA, customized employment, discovery. Um, ODEP is in the process through um, our lead center of um, both um, collecting information um, through a little, a little contract uh, amendment to, to identify where customized and discovery is in fact in every single state. So that if you're in one state versus another state, you'll be able to go to their website and identify what's going on around customized and discovery in your states. It's a part of the law. We are hoping um, to be um, seeing more and more states, more and more VR agencies um, beginning to, um, to fund at least that aspect, not the employer tax credit, but, but sure. the skills of, right. around doing discovery and, and customizing positions as, as, they, are, um, as they are needed. I yeah. hate to cut you off, and uh, this has been a good discussion, the kind we like to have, but our time has run out, unfortunately. I did want to point out to people that the next policy forum is on uh, April 21st, uh, and it's about uh, housing services for Medicaid beneficiaries with behavioral health conditions. So I hope to see some of you there, particularly those interested in housing and uh, mental health. Uh, and thank you all for coming, and let's give our presenters a round of applause.